Good morning, everybody, and welcome to the Center for Strategic International Studies. Thanks for coming to our briefing on um, the budget. And you know, we've got some serious number crunchers here and some serious policy people here. I think Andrew Hunter will be joining us uh, shortly, but we wanted to get started. Um, and with that, um, many of you may have seen that you know Ryan Crotty's been promoted to deputy director of CSIS, according to the New York Times, and so. We would go to him first, but I, I'll go to our senior vice president, oh. Kath Hicks, really first. <laughs> okay. And you all know Kath, um, so I don't, I don't need to, her, she needs no introduction. But Kath, of course, came here after serving as principal deputy undersecretary for policy um, um, from 2009 to 2013. And so we're really glad that Kath came back to CSIS because, you know, we just need you. Bill, thanks very much. And thank Microphones, right. Give you all an opportunity um, early before the real press of next week is upon us to get some insight into what we expect to have in the budget um, and what you might want to be looking for. We'll be doing some pieces um, more immediately after the budget comes out that gets into the specifics of what we're going to see in there. So this is really a, a, a framing discussion focused largely on what Ryan's going to tell you this morning. I'll just say three very quick things up front before turning it over to Ryan. There's sort of three, I think everyone knows this, basic um, elements that are framing the budget issue set as it relates to defense. The first is, of course, the geopolitical. The world is not slowing down. We have the threats currently, of course, from ISIS. We have uh, the Russian-Ukrainian issues that have been hot, really, for a full year and heating up again today. <clears throat> we have continued concerns in the United States about the Chinese in the South and East China Seas, um, <clears throat> and that's sort of just a handful. Then there's the Ebola's of the world, other things that pop up that we um, maybe don't anticipate very well in advance. It's across every region of the world. It's state and non-state, so the threat environment and the challenge environment is pretty um, phenomenal. Second, of course, are the budget dynamics themselves, and I'm going to really let Ryan uh, speak to that, but I would just say one of the things I have heard said by insiders at the Pentagon within the last year since the last budget came out, the Department of Defense is still using the 2012 Defense Strategic Guidance as its basic strategy framework. It um, updated that in the 2014 QDR, but it's essentially the same uh, strategy. And as I have heard insiders say, that strategy was built $100 billion ago. Um, sequestration's effects uh, are not yet fully felt but the strategy most certainly can be executed at those budget numbers. So there is a mismatch underway, and the White House's approach to that appears to be to be um, putting the budget above sequestration, which again, Ryan will speak to. And then the last is, of course, the political issues, and that's at the macro level in terms of the partisanship in Washington and the ability to reach a grand bargain. But it's also at a more micro level in terms of the ability to squeeze more out of the defense budget. And here we get into issues like base realignment and closure, compensation, of course, the Compensation Commission will be coming out with its recommendations today, health care issues relating to the force. Um, all of these areas that we might categorize as efficiencies that eat away at the ability of the defense budget to fully fund the strategy um, are, are immense political challenges facing the Hill in the next few years. So with those three framing uh, comments, let me turn it over to Ryan for the real details. <laughs> All right, thanks, Kath. I thought for a second that uh, strategy was going to get to go before budget again. The one time oh. of the year I, you know, I get to lead. Um, well, uh, so I'm just going to try to keep this definitely under 10 minutes to sort of go the get to your questions, but I wanted to sort of put everything in context here. So um, starting out with just kind of the overall federal budget, you know, I think of sort of the, the budget season kind of kicks off with uh, Monday's uh, release of the economic and budget outlook from CBO. And we saw exactly what we would have expected, but you know, we're, we're looking at a, a world in which deficits are back to their historical average as a percent of GDP, um, back to uh, pre-recession levels. Um, and then CBO says we're in sort of a four-year lull here between um, you know, deficits flattening out, um, our costs of income down, and then uh, before debt starts to rise again um, in 2018. Um, debt right now is 74% is of GDP, which is more than twice the 2007 level, back that pre-recession level, over $18 trillion. Um, and again, in 2018, that starts to grow again. 
Um, so I think it's in this climate uh, in that we look at the FY16 budget process, the final budget that will be both uh, built and executed by this administration, uh, providing a real opportunity to reconsider budget priorities uh, across the federal government, um, and which more germane to this conversation, uh, I think um, is gonna be acting on what seems to be a broad consensus uh, in both chambers and the, in the executive that uh, defense spending uh, as it has been the last couple of years is too low, um, given the global threat environment that, that uh, Kath mentioned. And so uh, trade-offs between defense and non-defense discretionary spending, uh, mandatory spending, and revenues um, will really be uh, the, the big questions, because um, that's what's going to be required to increase defense spending above uh, the sequester caps. Um, so to take that down to uh, now to the defense budget more specifically, um, as we all know, sort of in the, the federal budget picture, uh, this the positive economic story there sort of has a pall cast over it from um, the budget caps uh, created in the Budget Control Act of 2011. Um, those took uh, $950 billion out of uh, the 10-year defense budget. Um, now, if you include 2015, we've actually, you know, which has already been appropriated, we've made it through 40% of those 10 years. We've made it through four years already. Um, but because of the, re the, the structure of the caps and the way that uh, relief has, has been provided by Congress, we're really only 30% of the way through the total dollars that were supposed to come out from that, from that trillion dollars uh, in spending cuts. Um, so in some ways, an under, under sequester, even though the top line starts to rise, the worst in terms of uh, what had to come out um, of, of the baseline 2012 budget uh, is still to come. Um, so the BCA level in 2016 is $499 billion, uh, thereabouts, um, and that represents a 28% cut down from the peak level uh, in 2008 in constant dollars. Um, that's including the $51 billion that we expect to come in the OCO budget. Um, it's a 14% cut in the base budget um, from, again, from the peak. Uh, and the 2016 BCA cap is about $110 billion lower uh, than the baseline, which I was just referencing. So uh, that would be the biggest one-year cut um, so far. So if that's what sequester looks like, uh, we know that the president's budget is going to ignore that. Um, you know, it, as Kath mentioned, it's it's clear that you know he sees the prerogative um, that if he's going to support the strategy that that uh, the administration and DOD has uh, has uh, been relying on since early 2013, then $499 billion doesn't cut it. He's been very clear. And I think actually the, the chiefs yesterday on the Hill were very clear. Um, they went so far as to say things like, we can no longer do two of the 10 missions uh, at a, an acceptable level of risk. And um, I, there might have even been stronger statements than that. Um, but that is a, uh, I, I think actually, um, General Odierno might have even said that uh, that we can know, or excuse me, the, the Marine Commandant said he was no longer sure that they would be sized uh, to be able to do one major theater war, um, much less do a sort of a um, win-hold uh, situation. So you know, those are pretty stark uh, reminders of, of what the budget goes to um, in supporting the strategy. But um, in that, the President has given us a budget that's supposed to be $534 billion, so that's 34, 35, depending on how the decimals end up in the final budget, um, billion above the cap. Um, the OCO budget will be 51 billion, which is 13 billion dollars less than last year, 20 percent less. Um, it's actually almost the same amount for uh, the counter ISIS campaign, um, 5.3 billion. I think it was just an even five last year. Uh, interestingly, they're bringing back the European Reassurance Initiative. Uh, at about the same level it was funded last year, um, which I found interesting because I know that there were uh, definitely some officials quoted last year that this was a one-time ask, um, and that is clearly not the case. I mean, it's obviously uh, an, an important issue, and we can talk about that in terms of what um, what needs to be done with this budget. But um, you know, that has clearly changed. Um, again, Counterterrorism Partnerships Fund um, will, uh, has an, uh, an ask again. They asked for four billion last year and got something like 1.3. Uh, they're asking for just over two this year. Um, so all things combined here, we're looking at a total budget of, uh, of about $585 billion. 
um, which is uh, equivalent, if you look in constant dollars, including OCO, at about the 2003 level, um, which is uh, significantly uh, lower than what we've seen in the past couple of years, even with this increased base budget, you know, we're seeing sort of a, um, a shifting back to a uh, uh, less wartime footing. So um, what's inside that top line? Um, the FY15 budget sort of provided a roadmap to what we should already expect this year. Um, you know, the, the high and low priorities, those first in, first outs, I think we already kind of have a sense of uh, because the Opportunity Growth and Security Initiative last year um, provided that $26 billion of, of unfunded priorities, the first things that the President would have put back in had he not been restrained by uh, the Bipartisan Budget Act. Um, so those were things like Army Rotary Aviation, uh, Reapers, P8, C-130s, um, you know, restoring some of the readiness funding to uh, especially Army and Navy and bringing back some of the MILCON that had been cut very deeply. Um, similarly, they provided you know, those, uh, those first outs, the, the estimated impacts of sequester level funding. Um, we know that procurement took a, a, the most significant hit under the sequester scenario uh, for the fit up those uh, Procurement is something like 18% of the budget, but it um, would have had to take about half of the cut um, to get down to sequester over over the uh, over the fit up, and so I think that roadmap is largely uh, what we should expect in FY16. Um, you can see many of those uh, exact programs popping up in the early sort of uh, leaks coming out. Um, but I think the last question that we have to ask is what are the priorities that need to be fit in for FY16 that we didn't have in 15? Because um, there's been a lot that have popped up over the last year. I mean, the European Reassurance Initiative is one, but things like uh, you know increases um, for modernizing the nuclear enterprise, um, R&D plus ups for the long range research and development plan, the Defense Inici Innovation Initiative, the Aerospace Innovation Initiative just uh, uh, brought up yesterday by Secretary Kendall. Um, you know, those are significant initiatives, plus the efficiencies that were rejected in FY15. You have, uh, whether that was the, the carrier overhaul, um, remember that the Army and the Marine Corps were actually funded in the fit up at, at a lower level, at 420,000 and 175,000, uh, respectively. Those need to come back up um, to the levels that have been agreed on. Um, and then see what efficiencies will be resubmitted. Um, and I think we all expect to see the A 10 again, probably. Uh, RAC will probably be back in there, maybe the U-2, uh, what, see what they do with uh, uh, Navy surface ships, whether they offer up the, uh, the cruiser layups again. Um, you know, one of the things that we did see is that there was uh, um, a few places where Congress kind of took half steps toward uh, allowing um, some of these efficiencies to be pulled in, and one of those was uh, allowing a couple of, of um, the cruisers to, to be put into phase modernization. Uh, see if DOD will start to try to put more money back into readiness accounts again, which Congress sort of pulled back in the actual appropriation. They shifted some of that money away. Um, so there are a lot of other long-term issues that we can talk about in your questions, but I want to make sure we get to those. So just a few things to remember coming up. You know, we have our uh, budget release on the 2nd, um, the, the public release of the um, Retirement and Compensation Commission. Um, is going to be on the 3rd. On the 4th is Dr. Carter's nomination hearing. Um, so a lot of big things, but then we also hit uh, end of February is about when we're hearing the appropriation subcommittees um, are going to uh, start pulling in. Um, and then in March, uh, supposedly the, the authorizing committees will have their hearings. Uh, and then March 15th, debt ceiling, and April 15th, budget resolutions um, are due. So those are some um, a lot of things to get through in the next uh, couple of months. You know, I think one of the things that I've been happy to see is that February 2nd, the, the statutory date of the budget, it's coming out. Um, so the first step toward sort of a, a regular debate and order of, of the budget has started. Uh, so we will see and hope that that continues. But uh, I'll turn it back over to my colleagues here, and then you guys can go to questions. Uh, actually, Ryan covered a lot of, of what I'm going to talk about, so I'll be very brief. But uh, just to magnify a little bit some thoughts on modernization and acquisition and if research and development. Know, if you all don't, sorry. If I didn't get a chance to introduce Andrew, but if you all don't know Andrew, Andrew uh, just joined CSIS recently. He worked for a guy named Ash Carter at the Pentagon for uh, a few years, and, and now we've got him here. So we're very fortunate to have Andrew leading our defense industrial practice. Sorry, I should have introduced myself. Thank you, Andrew. Uh, Andrew Hunter. 
uh, head of director of the Defense Industrial Initiatives Group at CSIS, and lately, uh, three months ago, out of the Pentagon. Uh, but uh, excited to be here at CSIS. Uh, so some thoughts on acquisition and modernization, things to look for. Ryan indicated several. Let me just amplify a little bit. Uh, you know, the decline, and I want to focus mostly on the decline in the R&D uh, budget. Uh, it's actually been uh, almost exactly followed and traced the pattern that Ryan described overall, which is a 28% decline from the peak year uh, to where it was in 2015. And, of course, we'll, we'll see what happens in 2016. Uh, but I would uh, draw your attention within that, uh, within that budget, uh, there's a significant magnifying effect that's happened to the, uh, the R&D funding that actually goes to industry to deliver technology uh, for future procurement. And that's because the S&T portion of the R&D budget has been protected, which is, I think, on the whole, a good thing. Uh, but the necessary effect of that is fewer and fewer R&D budgets then are able to go out for the development of technology into military capabilities. You're doing more on the research, basic research side. That means you're doing less on the uh, end item development side. Um, and uh, also, a, a portion of the R&D teaming budget is, is kept internal to the department. And my suspicion, based on what we're seeing in the contract numbers, is that that internal portion of the R&D budget has also been relatively protected, which is understandable because you don't just you know, go out and fire all your civilians who are working in your government labs. Uh, that's uh, not really possible and, and maybe not wise. Uh, and so uh, that effect of that R&D decline is significantly <coughs> magnified for industry, um, possibly as much as double uh, the impact. Uh, and certainly for the Army, that has been the case. The Army's uh, the contract spending the Army has put out for research and development contracts uh, has fallen by 60% since the peak. So your 28% decline basically doubled in the case of Army's modernization as it goes to industry for developing capability. Uh, so it'll be interesting to see es essentially uh, what happens in 2016. Does that decline continue? Even if the R&D budget as a whole stabilizes, that portion going to industry I suspect will still probably be on the decline unless there were heroic, uh, heroic things that were able to be done. Uh, and I know there were some attempts there. On that end, uh, Ryan mentioned some of the uh, potential investments for the Defense Industrial Initiative. That's definitely something to look for. Along those lines, I, I would look and maybe uh, ask about uh, whether there's specific efforts relating to prototyping that are funded in the, in the FY16 budget. Uh, that's something that uh, presumably would support the Innovation Initiative. Um, and potentially support uh, retaining some of the design capabilities uh, within industry uh, that are at risk in, a, in an era when we're procuring so few new build systems. Um, I would also you know, keep your eye on programs that have maybe been indicated by the services in the past, maybe on the bubble, or have historically been on the bubble. Uh, and I think the thing to look for there is, given that the budget request is coming in above sequestration, um, might consider that a little bit of a, of a high watermark. Um, so then how good are things? How good do things look in this budget, keeping in mind that it's probably the best case scenario? And my takeaway from Ryan's comment was the, the worst is still to come. Uh, a very cheery, uh, very cheery thought for this morning. Um, you know, so as good as this budget may or may not be on some of these systems that have been on the bubble, uh, you know, that's the best case scenario. And I'm thinking of things like TX, uh, joint like tactical vehicle, uh, the procurement of amphibs, things that either have historically been right at the cut line and maybe haven't made it or have just squeezed in, uh, or that the services have actually said, you know, this is right at our, our bubble um, and right at the edge. Uh, it'll be interesting to see where those are in this budget uh, and then extrapolate what it means if we go back to the sequester levels for things like that. Um, two more things. Uh, it's worth, I think, looking at the acquisition workforce and the funding that affects it in this budget. So that's uh, the Defense Acquisition Workforce Development Fund, which is the mechanism for continuing to professionalize and, in and increase the professionalization of the workforce. Um, and then just what's happening to the size of the acquisition workforce in this budget uh, in terms of their numbers. Uh, and what does that look like compared to what happened in the 90s to that workforce? Uh, and then lastly, on rapid acquisition, uh, the department has been trying to create a uh, some enduring mechanisms to help finance rapid acquisition, and obviously the pace of operations has, with the counter ISIL mission, has stayed relatively high, uh, although not quite as high as it was. Uh, but that is not going away, and so things like the JIDO, the budget for JIDO, um, the department has struggled to get that into the base budget, but it has included base budget funding uh, in some prior years for that. 
that'll be something to look for. I'd like to open it up to your questions. Uh, please use the microphone if it's near you um, and identify yourself and your news organization will be very helpful for the transcript. And we will have a transcript out uh, later this afternoon as well as uh, some audio from this event, audio and video from this event. So questions, please. Jeff. Thank you. Jeff Mason with Reuters. Many of us have uh, stories out this morning um, based on info from the White House saying that they are going to propose an end to sequestration um, and a spending increase both for domestic programs and for military. Uh, can you give some thoughts about, A, the likelihood of that ever happening, uh, and B, how you see that sort of looking in the actual budget, to the extent that you can on the domestic program side in addition to the uh, defense side? Um, so uh, you know, the, the as I said kind of earlier with that consensus, of course, the consensus is only on one of the three legs of what, what needs to happen in order for um, any real change to happen. And that's, that's on the side that we're talking about, the defense side. Um, but the, the non-defense, uh, the mandatory, and, and the revenue, uh, there is distinct disagreement. And certainly the political calculus that, that says that you know, the deficit can't go up um, is really what actually drives you away from being able to change the spending levels, change uh, the, the caps. Um, I am um, somewhat pessimistic. I mean, I think that you've already seen uh, coming out of the State of the Union and, and as the budget stuff starts to roll out, um, the immediate reaction uh, from congressional Republicans um, uh, reacting to what is, you know, seems to be a uh, uh, tax loophole change uh, as the most significant factor in um, in freeing up money for discretionary spending. Um, and uh, there is just a core <laughs> disagreement um, between uh, Republicans and Democrats about uh, where that money has to come from. Uh, I mean, I think that the Paul Ryan budget we saw um, two years ago is really the, the benchmark for what can be expected out of uh, House Republicans, what they want out of the budget. They're going to want to find money for defense in non-defense. That is so uh, clearly anathema to the president um, and what he sees as his priorities. Um, I actually think that there is uh, not a high likelihood of us getting all the way back up to this um, to this budget level of, um, of spending on probably either the defense or non-defense side. Um, I think that the, the question is, can they get another Ryan Murray style um, sort of short fix that actually gets you, uh, you know, maybe $10, 20000000000 billion this year um, and uh, sort of gives you another bridge to making an agreement. I mean, I, I made mention of the four-year lull. I mean, I, I do think that we are in, in the moment where a grand bargain is really needs to happen. Um, and, and unfortunately, I think the political calculus is still just too hard to get all the way there. And it's going to be small changes. It's going to be add two years to the back end of um, of the BCA to find some money there, maybe because of the way uh, deficits have, have dropped below expectation, maybe you can find a little bit of money there, um, but, uh, but I think that it's going to be pretty hard. Um, sort of along the same lines, um, Congress or the, the leaders of Congress from uh, both uh, the House and the Senate have said they were going to try to have a regular order budget this year. So um, I is that um, likely to happen? And as far as the defense budget, how are they going to handle sequestration? At what point in the year are they going to, you know, is everything going to go haywire like, you know, like they did a couple years ago? When is that going to happen this year? Uh, I'll start. Um, the, the uh, I mean, I think that the the biggest hurdle in regular order is going to be a concurrent budget resolution. I think it's going to be very hard, even with Republicans running both houses, um, to get something that that uh, House Republicans are going to put into uh, a budget resolution that um, Senate Republicans who are largely up for re-election in 2016 are, are going to be uh, willing to get behind. And it will certainly be hard to find anything 
um, that gets the votes. I mean, Andrew can talk about the potential for reconciliation maybe as, as a mechanism um, for, for finding some areas. Uh, but I actually think that the head regular order breaks down on April 15th when we don't have a, con uh, a concurrent budget resolution. Um, so I think that we can expect uh, another CR now that the caps are slowly increasing each year. Um, you know, a, a continuing resolution at the beginning of the year doesn't trigger anything horrible. Um, so I think that that is probably a likely mechanism and we start pushing up against, uh, you know, end of December, January, as we've seen the past couple of years, and that's when we find a small deal. Yeah, I would agree. I mean, there is a, a strong incentive for both houses of Congress to use budget reconciliation as a mechanism to move their agenda forward. Uh, because it significantly uh, reduces the burden in the Senate, the number of votes that you have to get. And many of their primary objectives are budget related, so they're ideal candidates to be included in a budget reconciliation measure. Uh, but as, as Ryan said, you know, the, the different political dynamic that faces Republicans in the Senate is probably going to make getting to a consensus budget resolution, which is required to uh, enable the reconciliation process. They don't need the President's signature, but they do need a consensus between House and Senate. To, to start the reconciliation process and to use that mechanism, uh, that's going to be pretty challenging because I think, you know, consistent with the way the Ryan budget has done it in the past, to the extent Republicans in the House look to increase defense spending, it'll probably be offset from non-defense discretionary spending, and that's going to be a much tougher political sell in the Senate. And they just don't, you know, then to, to get to the margins that they would need, that's going to take some, some tough votes from, from people who are up for re-election. start um, the uh, I, I expect that um, I, I actually it's a good question because I, I'm curious to see what will actually be in the, um, the DOD request knowing that uh, the the Commission will have will be coming out essentially simultaneously with the budget I expect there will be uh, some things in there we already know what the pay raise is supposed to be uh, they've asked for a 1.3 percent which is still below below statutory but above 2015 1.3 percent so um, so there obviously will be some there there have to be assumptions built into the budget and so um, you know we will absolutely have to see some of those um, I I expect there will not be any big proposals knowing that the the fight is to come post budget um, you know I know that with the Commission I think there are some expectations of a, a really significant um, uh, thoughts for changes in the retirement system. Um, I don't know if you guys have heard any more. Well, I, I, I've had not heard more details. I, I have one uh, maybe uh, borderline speculation to offer, which is uh, of all the components of the compensation piece, uh, you know, the, the pay piece, uh, it's, it's a little bit arithmetical, you know, so you can say, oh, well, 1.3% versus 1.5 or whatever the statute would imply. Uh, it, it doesn't maybe raise hackles in the same way. But the other thing that I would, I would look at is really the health care budget um, because on the pay side, you know, the decision to increase compensation in the, in the early 2000 period was a very conscious one uh, and something that the committees of Congress and the Congress was promoting. And so uh, sort of shifting direction on that requires a shift, uh, a change of mindset that is not impossible but that is hard. Um, and similarly, on retirement, uh, there was a lot of decisions made by the Congress to, to put in place the retirement system that exists today. On health care, I feel like uh, much of the increase on health care spending has just sort of happened. You know, there was no conscious initiative by the Congress to say, we really want to increase the health care benefit for, you know. It was something that sort of evolved over time, and uh, with the exception to some extent of, you know, TRICARE for Life and, and health care for retirees, a lot of that health care expense growth has been uh, not something that was driven by any sort of policy decision. So I think it makes it a little easier to then go back and say, I don't have to change my mind to support scaling back uh, the, the size of the health care spending budget. So I'm, I'm 
uh, a little bit more hopeful that there's room for progress in that area. I think that there may be um, some I mean, we really take congressional action, and I think that uh, while that is possible, um, I, I don't see any uh, big moves coming. I think that you probably get uh, DOD reacts and says, man, we'll have to think about how we would do that, um, and then, uh, and then um, really not expect much action until 2017. So we already have a stepped up posture uh, for the United States as part of the overall NATO commitment, um, and that largely is represented in terms of exercises and troop deployments, naval presence and air presence in the Baltic states and Poland. So I think it would be a continuation of that. The specific exercises and deployments probably aren't fully set yet for 2016, but it would be set at a level of effort to sustain that degree of U.S. engagement. So Baltic air policing support, for instance, again, troop deployments um, that uh, demonstrate our resolve for NATO. But I don't think that they'll have specific exercises set up um, at the time that they release the budget. Um, and I would just add to that as, as a broader conceptual issue, um, and one that uh, Clark Murdoch and I, who unfortunately can't be here today, but um, uh, just wrote about, um, you know, it is we are reaching the point as we have um, moved out of Afghanistan. I mean, we, we know about, you know, the, the ISIS campaign is the big headline, but it's really still a very small percentage of, of OCO, it's only 10%, uh, um, that we are uh, now getting into continuing to add new things that we consider contingency operations. And I think that uh, one of the things, obviously the caps have been sort of what has forced a lot of things into that. And it is really important to start thinking about what is it that we, that is our sort of peacetime baseline global presence. Because really you, uh, you know, OCO is sort of becoming a reflection of just how the US operates in the world, um, probably for a long time going forward. Um, so you know whether it's um, you know, Operation Enduring Freedom things that are happening, uh, you know, I think the specific authorizations for for use of OCO is you know 20 countries, but also any other country you want to. Um, but explicitly, I think it's something like 20 that fall into it, um, and and it's really kind of everywhere now. And so starting to rethink about what needs to be something that is a uh, annual planned uh, part of the budget. Um, and what is really emergency and contingency? You know, I think that that, that very, very gray line, um, probably, uh, especially if we get some kind of agreement, should probably be something that we revisit um, as as budgets start to start to creep back up. Um, because right now we're looking at a, a world in which the OCO budget is, you know, forty billion dollars forever. I don't think that's how you want to budget for things. Let me just. <laughs> Let me just comment on that to say uh, Ryan's completely right, and I just would say it the opposite way, which is to the extent that you do not get an agreement, OCO is a politically expedient way um, and is particularly expedient to the extent that the uh, line is gray for all parties to um, ensure that there's some funding, um, particularly for readiness and near other near-term requirements. Um, while you are not able to resolve the sequestration problem. And I suspect back to the pessimism that Ryan offered earlier, I agree with that, and I suspect that's the reality that we're facing for the next few years, is that you'll have OCO used as a relief valve. You won't get a, a grand bargain as much as I would like there to be one. And um, if, to the extent that the environment stays uh, rough and tumble, I think that's the world we're in. If it gets much worse, it might help push a grand bargain. If it gets much better, you might see OCO come down. Yes. Hi, Jen DiMasio from Aviation Week. 
Um, I wanted to follow up on the, um, the European initiative. Are there any um, equipment, uh, is there any equipment that might be funded as part of that this year? I'm not aware of any in there. And that's, it, it is not related, just to be clear, to any Ukrainian aid. That would be a right. separate uh, issue. But I don't, I'm unaware of any NATO equipment support that's in that funding. Okay. Um, and then also I wanted to follow up on the aerospace um, in innovation initiative. What do you see kind of coming out of that? And when you were talking about the R&D budget and the S&T budget being off balance, do you see um, that focus on innovation shifting that S&T to R&D balance at all, or just shifting it for those uh, programs um, like a, a future fighter um, specifically, and then draining accounts for, for other R&D efforts? Well, I will confess that I am not really familiar with what the content of the Aerospace Innovation Initiative is, so I can't really speak to what I think it'll do. I, I think in general, you know, the, the prototyping initiatives that Frank Kendall has talked about in the past have all been designed not to drain, you know, uh, sort of designed in a way that they wouldn't drain from ongoing acquisition programs, but they would sort of keep alive that design ability. Uh, at a time when, you know, the programs we do have are a lot of cases just upgrades to existing systems, and so they don't involve a lot of design expertise. So they do at the margins for whatever subsystem is being upgraded, uh, but they're not whole system design exercises. So, it, you know, it's been, in the past at least, it has been trying to kind of find that balance between something that is not terribly expensive, keeps the design capabilities, uh, you know, alive, um, but doesn't become large enough that it eats into, you know, the base of, of what small amount of acquisition is still ongoing. Uh, and I would, you know, I would expect to see that going forward. Now, over time, as you get out three, four, five years into the future, um, obviously, if this innovation initiative, uh, defense or aerospace version, going to be successful, you want to start to see some of those ideas that are small um, turn into programs um, or get incorporated into programs of record. So. Um, to the extent that some of these innovations may be more at the subsystem level or at the, you know, sensor level, uh, or you know, kind of communication systems level, you want to see those things migrate into an F-35 program or migrate into uh, the LRSB program uh, and be adopted, uh, and, and that's kind of the goal. So I, I see it happening more that way than you know, big new programs coming in and crowding out uh, what's on the table today. It's not a statutory requirement, but the Congress invites the Secretary. Uh, the Secretary can choose to decline the invitation, but that would be unprecedented, at least in my knowledge. Um, <clears throat> what uh, my understanding is what the agreement has been with the Congress is that they have pushed off the posture hearings so that he has time to be, first of all, that he can be confirmed without having to defend it. Um, which is why the confirmation hearing is right after the budget is released and he has no knowledge of that budget, which makes his confirmation hearing much easier. And then he has time to sort of become familiar with it. Um, you know, I, I'll turn this over to Andrew, who's had uh, experience, I was going to say more experience on the Hill, but I'll just say experience on the Hill <laughs> since I've had none. Um, but I believe the Secretary absolutely could work with Congress uh, and OMB and the president if there was something he wanted to change about that budget that's probably how he would do it quietly working with the committees um, but it is actually not unprecedented for a secretary to walk in and defend a budget that he uh, has not built uh, so I think that will be the case here yeah, two thoughts on that the, f the first is that uh, because Ash Carter was deputy secretary basically for the skimmer does anyone remember the skimmer <laughs> Uh, I'm sorry, I just got a. You, you just got a. <laughs> yeah, sorry, Kath. Um, so, you know, which is where essentially I would say the shape of, you know, how the department intends to deal with sequestration and how it, you know, where the department essentially drew its line, you know, snapped a chalk line and said, this is where we think the we don't want to go below line is, which I think their budget request will reflect kind of their bottom line. We need this at least this amount to, to do the strategy. Uh, the shape of that was largely defined in the, in, in the 
the skimmer and subsequent debates, all of which uh, happened uh, under Ash Carter's leadership and, and certainly during his tenure. So uh, I, uh, there has been change since he left the building. Uh, so it's, it's very true that the exact details of this budget, he'll, he'll need some time to, uh, to become familiar with. But on the other hand, I think he's very familiar with sort of the overall budgetary approach that this budget is likely to reflect. Uh, so it will not probably take him a tremendous amount of time to get back up to speed. Uh, on the congressional side, uh, yeah, I mean, you know, there's only one Secretary of Defense. The fact that he may or may not be familiar, terribly familiar with the budget that they're defending, that's always a problem when a new administration comes in. Um, you have a secretary, you know, who, who didn't, with the rare exception of Gates, who, you know, comes in usually didn't have anything to do with the building of the budget. Uh, you know, that is just a, that's just an understood dynamic. And um, in a lot of cases, the, the questions then directed to the secretary would be much more high level. And they won't expect uh, him or her to have the same, you know, conversance with the details that they would have later in their tenure. And just a quick follow up: Do you expect there to be some rate conversations with the secretary uh, to help lay the foundation for the budget to move forward? Like, Mayor Kinnor, do you expect there to be at least some of what had to be at the table to ensure that uh, uh, funds were kind of going to the right place? I I haven't seen any evidence of anything personal to Carter. Maybe personal is not the right word. Of anything that is particularly associated with him, his views, or his positions, uh, or his prior service. So that's a pretty clean slate from my perspective. Uh, I think it's, uh, several folks have been clear that they have serious issues with the president's policies, and they're going to go after those policies. Um, and obviously, the dynamic will be uh, to see how adroitly uh, Dr. Carter is able to defend those positions uh, in a way that doesn't, you know, sort of antagonize. Um, members of the Armed Services Committee and other members of the Senate. I personally believe that, that he will be very successful in that, um, So, uh, but obviously we'll have to wait and see. Inevitably, yes, they'll have to do at least a, in their PowerPoint presentation when they roll out, they'll have to do at least a slide that says crosswalks, what's, and that's really what it will be, what's in the budget and how it relates to the offset strategy. So I think it will be up to all of us as we look at that to see how much we think it really supports what's in the Hegel memo. Yeah, and I think, right, I think as sort of Andrew also described, you know, part of this is, a lot of this is probably going to focus into R&D things or be not necessarily uh, budget-focused items. You know, I think that a lot of the um, Better Buying Power 3.0 stuff that sort of feeds into the innovation initiative is part of it. Um, so I think there are some things that will be bullet points that are not necessarily budget bullet points. Um, but I would note that it's, if you go back and look at the, you know, whatever we, I guess we're calling the second offset strategy, the the Bill Perry under Harold Brown. Uh, you, you, I think you would have expected to go back and say, "Oh wow, look at like this huge R and D surge behind all of this great stuff." And you know, obviously, we can't see what happened in the black budgets, which is probably where a lot of stealth was. Uh, but when you go back and look, that is not really the case. Um, you know, it is. I think it's about a reformulating inside of the budget and having a, a strategy to what you're doing with the dollars that you already have, not necessarily adding. So again, I think it's probably going to be more uh, bullet points and, and text than it is dollars moving, although I think, yeah, they, they will definitely have to address where it's going. Um, but I don't, I don't see huge budget impacts from it. Yeah, but I, just to touch on that, I, there is a little bit of a timing mismatch here. Uh, I know I'd point out that the RFI that went to industry for their input on you know, where should the defense innovation initiative be focused, uh, that's still open. So at a time when we're still, the department, a little slip up there, I'm not there anymore, when the department is still uh, asking for feedback from industry about, you know, what is, uh, what is the hot stuff that's coming down the pike in 10 to 15 years that we need to be ensure that we're going to be able to leverage and stay on top of, uh, they had to put together the budget, you know, and, and going back, you know, probably four or five months, most of this stuff was, was, uh, was really laid in, in, not in concrete, but in some semi solid mix. So 
so I, I think uh, there ought to be, there probably will be maybe some, I'm going to have to use the word funding wedges associated with the Defense and Innovation Initiative, but I don't think you're going to see hard programmatic at this stage because a lot of that homework is still being done as we speak. I just wanted to add, I mentioned at the beginning that we have um, some analysis coming out. We're aiming for the day after the budget for the, for the third, and um, Andrew's going to have a piece on offset and innovation once we get a chance to look at that budget. policy person in the room so I'm not this is not my forte but I've also been a manager in government for a long time so how does it happen it comes down to how you count people is a big piece of it whether it's you're counting full-time equivalents or bodies and that's different there's also particularly since 9-11 there's just been a huge growth in non-traditional billeting so um, you have temporary billets you have a lot of contractors of course which I think everyone's familiar with those issues um, so oftentimes what they'll do is try to count computer accounts, but then again, that's not the same as full-time equivalents you may have, and you may have people with multiple computer accounts. So part of it just gets down to how do you count the people? Do you just count full-time government employees and make that your cut, ba the, the base upon which you're going to cut, which is honestly unfair to how you might want to cut. You might want to cut a lot more contractors out of the system, depending on what the particular function of the headquarters is. Um, so that's on, that's how you get to that problem. You have touched on more broadly an issue the department has long faced, which is how to be make a convincing case that cuts, whether it's under sequestration or whatever the cuts may be, are really that harmful when in fact there seems to be sort of this slush of money or an inability to account for the money. We don't have great auditability in the department. <clears throat> Marine Corps and Coast Guard are good. Other services are lagging, and OSD is, is and is quite far behind the the services. So um, it's a fair question and something that I think you have the comptroller and uh, the chief, the deputy secretary, really focused on in the deputy chief management function. You may know there has been legislation to create an undersecretary for management which is part of the effort to get at issues just like this. And I believe the statute requires that position to be established by 2017. I may have the date wrong. But I think you'll see in the next two years movement toward establishing that position, if not actually establishing it early. And these are the kinds of things that they'll be trying to get after. Can I just say, I think one of the issues, I haven't read the GEO report, so I'm at risk here, but I one of the issues I've experienced in the past is that there are different definitions of what's headquarters, you know, and so uh, there's a definition, there's just, there have been in the past statutory definitions, um, which there used to be an annual reporting requirement, which I think eventually was either softened or maybe done away with, uh, and so that's one definition of headquarters, but then you find that I suspect if you go back and look, you'll discover that's an unsatisfactory definition of headquarters. It made sense at the time it was adopted, but you know, as Kath has indicated, the way that uh, manning, uh, billeting is a better word, of, of OSD works has changed a lot. And so uh, I think you'll find probably that older definition was found to be inadequate. Secretary Hagel took on and, and you know, established a goal to reduce headquarters by 20%. And so obviously you have a different than definition of what that means for headquarters. Uh, and uh, my understanding of that initiative was that they, they wanted to take account of this you know, need for flexibility that Kath mentioned of, you know, let's be thoughtful about 20% doesn't necessarily mean reduce every aspect of the workforce 20%, just 20% 20 20 in total, maybe more contractor heavy, maybe more government heavy, depending on the organization um, and its structure. Uh, and so I think that's where when GAO kind of goes to say, you know, what's really happening, it gets all muddled because everyone may be coming at it a different way and people may be using different definitions of what constitutes headquarters. Uh, I, 
I don't, my personally, I don't draw from the conclusion from that that nothing's really happening and no reductions are happening. I think they really are happening. Um, and, and that's actually something to watch over time. Uh, because, again, the experience from the 1990s is we came out and we said, okay, we're going to reduce. And um, the mechanism of government left to their own devices will not necessarily reduce in a rational way. Um, and you know, everyone's favorite way to reduce is through attrition because it doesn't require you to force anyone out the door. Um, but that doesn't necessarily allow you control that you're reducing in the places where you have the most excess. Um, and just to take it past the, just the specific headquarters, but to the efficiencies question writ large, I mean, I think that uh, a, a big question to be faced in the, in the coming years is we have um, you know, something like $245 billion of, of efficiencies in the 12 to 2012 to 2018 time period that, that were um, literally negative funding wedges. They were assumed. Um, and, and whether we get any accounting of that, I mean, that runs through 2018. 2018 is not that far away in terms of building a budget. You know, how, how have we done, I think, is a, a really good question because $245 billion is, you know, twice what the president has put in the fit up above the BCA caps. You know, that, that's a lot of money that, uh, that is supposedly has, has come out, so. My honest answer is those are all, everything you have laid out um, are part of how we speak, you know, the pro what the president has said certainly in terms of his emphasis on partners picking up, you know, burden for the counter ISIS, certainly the Iraqi government itself in the case of Iraq, the Europeans and others, um, all of that is true. That said, it is not the case, I think, that it would greatly affect in any way the defense budget that we put forward. We tend to be very cautious in the United States about assuming what's going to be brought to bear by allies and partners. Um, so I think there's some amount of coordination, of course, that's going on um, in terms of developing the budget for the U.S. And there is certainly some amount of funding um, in terms of the counterterrorism initiatives um, in particular, and then as we mentioned before, the, the wrap for Europe and then potentially a package for Ukraine. Um, those are examples of where it built into the budget that the president will release will be some of those initiatives, some, some of which that money will be in DOD, some of which will be in, for instance, the State Department. Um, humanitarian aid to Syria would be another big example of that where he's had a big push. Um, but by and large, it's on the it's small amounts, relatively speaking, on the margin, and um, the bulk of the Defense Department budget is settled without regard to what other partners are bringing to bear. With the I should say more directly, with the assumption that the U.S. might have to act unilaterally, in some cases. Okay, with that, um, I'd like to thank everybody for coming to CSIS this morning. Uh, you can follow us at CSIS on, uh, on Twitter. Uh, we're also on Facebook and at uh, CSIS.org. We'll be sending out a transcript to all of you uh, later this afternoon. And uh, thanks for coming. During next week when the budget is actually released, please feel free to call us. We'll be sending out, as Kath indicated, uh, a, a, a manuscript of papers um, on this issue. Um, Ryan, do you want to give a sense of what we're going to be, um, what we're going to give out? And what we already have. Yeah, sure. So we we've got uh, one piece out um, <laughs> yesterday afternoon on uh, on sort of the the strategy budget alignment question and how we think about that going into a budget cycle, um, and then we're going to have a series of pieces coming out on Tuesday um, once once we see what comes out that addresses sort of the different you know our sort of our maritime forces, ground forces, those sort of specifics, uh, R and D, some uh, some things on on that we'll wait to see what we actually uh, get out of there. Um, some things on sort of the, the post-OCO and Yeah, and, and actually world. we'll have a specific piece on uh, partnerships and COCOM priorities, uh, partner programs. 
um, as well as uh, some some regional um, and, yeah. uh, and regional deterrence issues. So uh, sort of try to hit the, the large swath of issues coming out of budget season here. Terrific.